Good afternoon. This webinar will start in approximately one minute. Good afternoon and welcome to the completing the accelerated path for CFP certification webinar. Today we'll hear from John Loper, CFP professional and managing director of professional practice at CFP board to discuss the requirements for the accelerated path. And we'll hear from Ona Bolton, CFP professional and CPA, and Mike Golosovker, CFP professional and attorney, about their path to certification through the accelerated path. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please post them in the Q&A, and we will get to as many as we can at the end. Good afternoon. This is John Loper, Managing Director of Professional Practice at CFP Board, and I'm excited to share with you all uh, the accelerated path requirements. One of the most common questions we get from candidates who are pursuing certification is, is there anything that I've done? Are there any courses that I've taken uh, in the past that will apply towards CFP Board's coursework, education coursework requirement? And the good news is many candidates pursue our education or meet our education requirement through an existing credential. And some of the, and actually the existing credentials that we'll accept are listed here. Uh, let me read them to you briefly. Uh, if you're a CPA, a CFA, a CHFC or CLU from the American College, if you're a licensed attorney, if you have a PhD in financial planning, finance, business administration, or economics, or you have a CFP certification from another territory, so outside the United States, you may qualify for the accelerated path requirement. And I say may only because you're required to document that you have this um, and you submit that documentation to the email education at cfpboard.org. CFP, I'm sorry, education at cfpboard.org. Dot org is where you send that. And then we'll verify that you have it. Once you've done that, the only requirement that you have in order to meet our, our education requirement is to take the capstone course. And that capstone course can be taken at any registered program that offers it. Um, so your credential plus the capstone course, you meet our uh, education coursework requir requirement you would, you would then be ready uh, to take the CFP certification exam. One of the things I wanna comment on, and I think some of our speakers will address here, is that it's crucial, even if you meet our, our coursework requirement through one of these uh, uh, credentials, the importance of preparing adequately for the comprehensive exam. So this certainly doesn't get you out of that preparation. Uh, and we find that most candidates will take anywhere from three months to six months after they take the capstone course and in preparation for, this, for the comprehensive exam. Let's move on to the next slide. The capstone course, more specifically, um, what is that? That's our financial plan development course. Um, that's where you develop uh, and present a comprehensive financial plan. Um, as a result of the capstone course, we can say, uh, that everyone who becomes CFP certified has been involved in financial plan development. And once again, this information can be obtained from registered programs who offer the capstone course. Next slide.
Thanks so much, John. That was very helpful. If you have any questions about the uh, capstone course or the accelerated path requirements, please post them. I see the number of questions coming through, and so we'll get to those uh, at the end here. So I'd like to move on to Ona and Mike, our CFP professionals um, who earn CFP certification through the accelerated path. And I'd like to discuss their experience and share, you know, the opportunities that um, that they had and, you know, kind of what, what they thought about going through the accelerated path to earn their CFP certification. Ona, I'd love to start with you. I, I know you're a CFP professional, um, but you're also a CPA and PFS. Why did you choose to earn CFP certification? Yes, thanks, Amanda. Um, I have been a I've been in the financial service industry for now thirty years, um, and I got my I got my degree in accounting and I got my CPA pretty much right away. Worked in accounting, um, and and I worked for a big six accounting firm at the time, and. Um, and I, at the time, 20 years ago, I thought, oh, let me, let me take my CFP. I never completed it. I got the coursework. I never completed it. Um, and I had gone out on my own and started my own business. Um, and at the time I, with the business that I was doing um, in accounting, I didn't need my CFP. And I thought, oh, well, if I, if I ever need it, I will go back and take my exam. Um, and so uh, about seven, eight years ago, I started back at a firm. Um, and at that point, I realized that it would be beneficial for me to have my CFP. Um, I realized that um, I have my PFS and for CPAs out there, um, you probably know that, that it's a personal financial specialist. Only CPAs can get that personal financial specialist designation. So, which means that I specialize in working with, um, with individuals in financial planning um, and it's through the AICPA. Um, but just like a CPA is the gold standard for accounting, I really felt that the CFP was the gold standard for financial planning. Um, I never felt like I had to have the CFP designation. I know a lot of firms that, that people work for, um, it's a requirement. I never had it as a requirement. It was something that I wanted. Um, and I, I do feel that um, the one thing that the CFP studying for it did add for me was just the knowledge, you know, just having that CFP, the marks, you know, having them now, um, you know, makes me, uh, people say, oh, well, I think, you know, hopefully she knows what she's talking about because she has her CFP, CPA, um, but also just what I learned in doing it, um, you know, I was, I have my master's in tax, I was strong on that, but I was weak in areas and everybody is weak in something and I was weak in the um, investments area and also in retirement planning. And so in taking the coursework, um, I learned, you know, when you get the formula sheet and it looks like it's uh, a foreign language, I had to teach myself that. Um, and uh, also just in retirement planning, choosing the best retirement plan that fit there. So for me, it was definitely, it was very beneficial. All the, the nine practice areas that the CFP board is, is promoting, it improved my knowledge. Um, for me, unfortunately, I did not pass my exam on the first time. It actually took me four times to pass. Um, I, I am in my 50s. I have five kids. Um, and I can say that, um, you know, I took Kaplan the first time and then I took Danko. Um, I'm, I don't blame anybody for not passing. It was completely on me. And me failing um, really made me be brutally honest with myself on why I wasn't passing. And for me, it was focus. Um, and really, I would say, you know, everybody has to um, decide, you know, what, what they need to do to pass this exam. And for me, it was focus. Um, and I had to refocus every day that I studied. Um, but I, I, again, I think the CFP, I'm, I'm so thankful I did it. And um, I would recommend it, you know, to anybody who's, who's looking to go down that path. That's a really great story, Ona. And, you know, you put a lot of hard work into earning CFP certification and stuck with it. And I'm sure you glad, you're, you're glad that you did. And, and you did talk about that a little bit. Um, just to go into that a little bit more, does having since earned the CFP certification, how has that benefited you? Have you seen a difference in, you know, your work life? Um, yeah, I, I do. Cause I feel like, you know, I, so I'm the director of financial planning at my firm, uh, and building out financial plans. Um, I use the knowledge that I learned while studying for the CFP and, and again, because it's so broad, but it's so detailed, um, it's. I'm able to pick up different things um, 
you know, oh, if it has someone considered this, oh, think about this, because it all ties in together. Um, and I, I love working on financial plans and really just looking at the big picture and, and helping people. Um, you know, being a CPA, I, I, uh, I started off in audit, then I did tax. Um, I did corporate tax. I didn't like it at all. I moved into individual. And, and what I felt about doing that, it was very reactionary, preparing returns after the fact. And, you know, 20 years ago, I, I really, I moved into financial planning. And at the time, 20 years ago, Ernst & Young, who I worked for, did do financial planning, which they don't do anymore. But um, I, I love the planning side. I love helping people. And bottom line, um, I just, I love helping people. And so just having those CFP marks and the knowledge that I gained has really helped me. That's great. That's really great to hear. Um, I know you mentioned, you know, have, you know, studying and taking um, Kaplan and then Danko as the review course. Do you remember what capstone course you took and how about how long it took you? I know that we have a lot of individuals who kind of want to know length of time to, uh, to prepare and really kind of be able to focus on making sure they get the capstone completed to sit for the exam. Sure. Um, I, I was very thankful that the CFP board offered the accelerated path. Um, and so I did a lot of research and, and um, you know, again, found out about the capstone. Um, I took it through, I believe it was Kaplan at the time. Um, and so really just, I think there were, I don't know who it's offered through right now, but I, I took it through Kaplan and I, I, I think I spent about a, a month and a half studying and then just drove, I jumped right into studying and took a review class. Um, so I had started off with Kaplan twice and then thought I'd try something else and, and switched over to Danko and did that twice. Okay, great. And one last question for you. Uh, any advice to those deciding whether to add CFP certification to their credentials, be it a CPA, attorney, or you know, other, other qualified credentials in the industry? You know, do, do you have any other advice um, if when people are kind of deciding whether to add CFP certification? Um, my advice would be, I mean, if it's something that you want to do, do it. Like for me, I, I just, I always, I wanted it. I, it was something that I wanted. Um, it was something that I could do, um, because I already had my PFS. It was, it was an area. And again, I, I just viewed it as the gold standard. Um, and so just, you know, go for it. If it's something that you're interested in, um, and I and having that experience, I feel like whether it's a CPA or licensed attorney, you know, you have experience, which is going to help you with the exam and it's going to help you. Um, the CFP is going to just add to your knowledge and help you service your clients better, um, however, whatever your specialty is. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your insight and sharing your experience going through this accelerated path. Oh, sure. Mike, uh, you're an attorney in addition to a CFP professional. I'd love to ask you similar questions. Uh, why did you choose to earn CFP certification? Yeah, I'm happy to <laughs> happy to talk about it. I just also Ona, damn, your resume is amazing. So <laughs> just wow. Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, so how I ended up um, getting CFP? So this is always a, it's a, whenever I talk about it, it's always a little weird or silly because uh, I kind of fell into it a little bit um, and then discovered how glad I was that I did. Uh, so um, I, you know, I was an attorney, I was a practicing attorney for about five years and then I changed careers and became a financial advisor uh, now, about nine years ago now. Uh, and then, um, and I didn't have my CFP for, you know, long, longest time. And then in 2020, in the beginning of the summer of 2020, uh, that's when I discovered the accelerated path existed. And, you know, I, you know, I have, a, you know, I'm married, I have a, I have one kid, but, you know, I have a daughter and that takes up a fair amount of time. And I, you know, getting the full CFP, um, going through the whole CFP process was, you know, time and money wise, pretty daunting. And then I discovered that there was this way that I could sort of, you know, just do it for faster and cheaper. Uh, and suddenly I was like, oh, I could do that. Uh, so I sort of, like I said, kind of fell into it accidentally when I discovered that it existed, um, that this path existed. Uh, but having done that, you know, I'm so, so glad that I did. It's been really remarkably useful in a bunch of different ways. Uh, I think that, you know, just to sort of add on or, or reinforce what Ona said about, you know, you learn a lot 
even just, even if you're just doing the capstone class and then you're doing the exam review, uh, you just learn a lot through that process. That is incredibly helpful um, in, in whatever your sort of financial career may be. So that was really glad about that. And also uh, the CFP marks I've discovered are a little bit, are kind of an interesting thing. Uh, I analogize them a little bit to having your, your law degree in that, you know, there's a lot of work in the law that people can do without a law degree. You know, you've got paralegals and you've got people kind of <laughs> around and adjacent and near, and near lawyers doing a bunch of legal stuff. Um, and so getting the law degree, right, is a sort of like gold standard next, you know, potential next step if they wanted to do that. Uh, and, and yeah, and the CFP mark is, is sort of that gold standard for the industry to, to repeat that phrase. But then um, if you're a lawyer and you're working with lawyers doing lawyer things in lawyer rooms, uh, you know, the JD at that point is just table stakes, right? You just have, it's just assumed everybody has one when you, you know, when you're in sort of a certain arena. And in my experience, the CFP become, um, also kind of becomes that. It becomes table stakes for a lot of places and a lot of people, you know, for a lot of jobs that they want it, um, you know, just by default, or as you move up in the sort of sophistication of clients, you know, they start to be aware of it and kind of want to demand it. Um, and so opens doors for you or prevents you from getting a door slammed in your face and, no, you know, before you even have a chance to talk to somebody. Uh, so, you know, so I just think it's been just a really valuable experience. Uh, yeah, that's great. That's, 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 I think that's really helpful insight. And I think that's really helpful to acknowledge, right, that CFP certification, you know, is, is an add-on, right? You, you have experience and you know, you know, what it's, what it's like to work with clients, but, but it really just kind of adds on that extra touch and, and beneficial information. And like you said, clients, you know, start to ask for it. Yeah, um, what, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have no, no, sorry. I was just uh, nodding along verbally, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what capstone course did you take and about how long did it take you to complete it before you started preparing for the exam? Uh, so the capstone, uh, I, I uh, actually had to look at, I had to remind myself, the capstone I did was uh, through the American College. So I did theirs. Um, and I did, I think, because I know that there's this sort of, there's like two versions of it. One where you do the class and then the project, which is write a financial plan. And then one where you can just do the project. I did the full thing, um, which I found helpful and useful because if nothing else, it gives you some templates that you can adapt uh, in your actual practice. Um, if you go on to do you know, financial planning. Um, so I found that pretty handy. Uh, and then, oh, I wanted to mention that. Uh, so I did that. Um, Took them out a month, finished towards the end of August, 2020. And then I jumped right into Danko, uh, Danko's exam review. And I just did that and took the exam November, 2020. Uh, and he, you know, <laughs> I know the CFP board as a whole can't really endorse anything. I can, however, and Danko was awesome. So <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of that. And the exam review process is incredibly, I. You know, it's not, it's one of those not a technical requirement, but it's a requirement. You, an exam review class is something everybody should do uh, for, for this. Um, and extra so if you're doing an accelerated path, right, where you didn't go through the six classes and have all those co course notes already. Yeah. No, peer, peer and firsthand experience advice is, is always very, very helpful. So I really appreciate that. Um, and question for you, any advice to those deciding whether to add CFP certification to their credentials, be it, you know, being a, an attorney or CPA or CFA or any of the other industry credentials out there, any, any other advice to provide? Um, I think, I mean, <laughs> there's a million bits of advice about like how to take the exam and things like that, but in terms of whether you should do it or not, if you're working, so I'm a, I'm a financial planner you know, who has a law degree and a, and a law license, right? Um, I don't practice law anymore. Um, and from that perspective, sort of a no brainer. And kind of if you're doing financial planning or being a financial advisor, I think the only reason you wouldn't do a CFP is right time or money, right? Very pragmatic logistical reasons. There's no like real downside to it. <laughs> um, you know, you have to you have to abide by some ethics rules, which more or less amount to don't screw over your clients. So that shouldn't really be a 
hard bar for anybody. Um, the uh, if, however, you're not sort of actively in financial advising, for, like if you're an attorney who's primarily practicing law and thinking about, hey, should I add this on? Then you know, is this the kind of stuff you're dealing with? Um, you know, if you're a high-end estate planning attorney who's actually dealing with people, uh, you know, who might have estate tax issues um, and you know, complicated investments and trusts and things. Yeah, it's probably going to add a, a fair amount of useful um, background to to what you're doing or high end tax planning and things like that. Same same thing. That's uh, great. Yeah. Yeah, I really appreciate your insight. And actually, one of the questions that would be really good to, that was posed by a uh, attendee, and I think would be great to answer here for both um, Ona and Mike. Did you feel that clients started respecting you more as an advisor uh, rather than merely, you know, a compliance person after adding, you know, a CFPA, a CFP to your CPA license or, you know, Mike for you, you know, did you feel, you know, once you added CFP certification um, to your financial planning uh, practice and, and, and job, you know, that you started get be more respected by clients? Um, and um, Ona, I'll ask you first uh, your experience there. I, I, I think so. I mean, I, I've never had anybody come out and say, oh, I, I mean, I have my, when I passed my exam, my firm put out like an announcement saying that I had passed. Um, so I think people know, I, but I, I do feel that it definitely makes a difference. I, you know, when I, when I ask clients questions or when I talk to them and, and they see my credentials, I do think it makes a difference. Um, you know, and it's, it's basically just, because of, of my CPA and because of my CFP and because of my knowledge, I'm I'm uniquely positioned to help them attain their goals. And so in client meetings, other advisors will say, oh, Ona is a CPA or she's a CFP. And I and I think clients clients definitely respect that. That's great. Mike, do you have um, a perspective on that? Uh, yeah. So my answer is also yes, but sort of indirectly. Um, you know. Yeah, so I, mean, I think I mentioned, right, the more sophisticated uh, your clients, they start to be aware of what a CFP is, right? But for them, you know, most, most of them aren't, right? I, so I have a whole bunch of designations. Um, I'm sort of a laundry list of initials after my name. And nobody really knows what they mean uh, for the most part. However, when I got it, I became more confident. And so it, it, it made me feel more sort of secure and, and clear. And also I had learned a bunch of things that were incredibly useful. And so I became a better planner. And so it had a sort of an indirect um, effect of clients sort of trusting me more because I was more competent and confident. That's great. Yeah, confidence is definitely key when it comes to anything. But I, I think that's, that's a really great insight. Um, and you know, you just, you have the knowledge, at, you know, in your brain. That's, that's, I think you both have really great stories and journeys to certification. Um, and I, I think that, I, you know, I really appreciate hearing that. And I'm sure, you know, everyone listening in appreciates that as well. Um, I'd like to transition actually over to preparing for the exam, you know, completing the accelerated path and just talk about uh, resources that you used. You know, we did discuss a little bit about taking the CFP exam and the review courses that you both uh, took, but I'd like to dive into that more. Um, Mike, I'll start with you this time. You know, you had industry knowledge starting the certification process. Did that help as you prepared for the exam? Uh, yes and no. So I think it definitely helped a lot, um, you know, and mostly yes, but there's a touch of no. The being aware, being having, you know, you're studying retirement plans uh, for an exam and you've opened retirement accounts, right? It's sort of, you're, you're familiar with the with, with what's going on, um, but you're just sort of studying a lot more of the technical fine details to some degree um, as an example, right? So it absolutely helped that, a, a, you know, I had a bunch of background knowledge that made the whole process a lot easier. I, you know, um, was a lawyer. So, you know, the estate planning piece, you know, piece becomes a lot easier when you know what a trust is walking into the room, not having to learn what a trust is to start with, and then the weird uses of them, uh, it, you know, as part of the exam. So, so it's, you know, definitely incredibly useful. The, the sort of the caveat, the, the one downside is that um, exam questions are not 
uh, real life practice question. Like, how, and so there can sometimes you can sometimes get a little tripped up between how you would how you would act in practice and how you would answer an exam because the exam is written to test you and to trick you to some degree and to um, deprive you of knowledge that you you know the most common thing you'll feel when you're taking the exam I think is I I wouldn't do any of these options I would ask this follow up question first right <laughs> uh, but you don't have the opportunity and so you know, so that can get in the way of things um, a little bit, but you kind of just train yourself out of that uh, when you're, when you're doing exam prep. Yeah, you're preparing for an exam, not to, to go into a client meeting. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, what did you do to prepare? You know, did you put, did you, so I know you took the Danko as the review course, you know, did they help you put together a study schedule? Did you, you know, dedicate time kind of, you know, if you remember how, about how much time did you dedicate for the CFP exam. So yeah, uh, let me think, you know, so Danko actually, you know, they definitely put a, a schedule together for you. Um, and it's, um, it worked out really, really well. Uh, the big thing, <laughs> the big thing is, uh, when it comes to at least the Danko review is you just do what the guy tells you to do, and life will be better. Uh, <laughs> you know, don't reinvent the wheel. It, he's really good at it. The, um, so there was a there was a there was a schedule. I think I technically started it like a few days late because of when my capstone finished. But um, I just stuck to the schedule, and yeah, every day I, um, for most of that fall, you know, I spent you know several hours a day. I realized I re initially was doing them sort of in the evening, and then I realized that wait a minute, much like everything else in my practice, I need to schedule things in the time that I'm going to actually do them, and so. I switched to studying in the mornings because I would actually do it in the mornings and not, um, you know, not pass out or whatever, because uh, I was so tired at the end of a long day. So I studied in the mornings for several hours every day for, you know, however many weeks that was. And then as you get closer to the exam, you know, it sort of, it increases, right? It kind of goes up. Um, but I just did that and it worked out, it worked out really well. Uh, you know, I, I'm good at tests. I guess. So that was kind of what I needed to do. Um, but it really was something that you needed to approach us with focus and, and, and intention and, and seriously. Um, it's a lot like, uh, you know, you know for, for any attorneys who may be listening, right? You know, when you did your um, bar prep class, you know, probably Barbary or something like that, you know, you spent however many hours a day that they told you to spend and you kind of treated it like a, you know, part or full-time job. And this is, this is no real different, um, you know? And uh, I always say, you know, the CFP exam is like half, a, is like half a bar exam. And that's, that's a, that indicates it being a hard and serious exam and you just treat it that way. That's great. Yeah. So definitely sticking to, sticking to the schedule is, is important and, and, you know, staying focused on preparation. What advice would you provide to someone who is going through the accelerated path to prepare? You know, do you feel like you need to do anything a little bit differently outside of the review course to supplement areas that maybe are a little bit weaker or, or did you end up doing anything differently there or just really, you know, you found the review course, took you through what you needed to know to be totally prepared going into exam day? Uh, I think, yeah, I think my answer is pretty boring on this. I just sort of, it, it worked out really well. Um, the one piece of advice that I took from the review course, but I'll want to repeat here because not everybody's going to do Danko, is um, towards the end is wait until you do the wait to do the practice exam because uh, the CFP board lets you do like a practice. Uh, wait to do the practice exam until towards the end, um, not at the beginning. Don't do it there. Don't benchmark yourself at the start. You do it towards the end because in that last week you're sort of doing triage, and that's when you want to benchmark what um what areas are sort of you know your best or worst at so you can target your time better in those final few days great yeah and the, and the only thing that i'd offer to that part is that we do have um two cfp board practice exams now so it is something that you could oh. you know you can use both you know maybe maybe and and you know i haven't taken the cfp exam and, and you and ona and and John can jump in here, but, you know, maybe, you know, using the one a little bit earlier on in, in the beginning and the second one later, you know, could be helpful, but um, 
but just want to throw out there that CFP board now, we do have two CFP board practice exams that individuals can use that are both full length uh, practice exams. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, Mike. I think that's really great advice. I think hearing, you know, how you prepared and, you know, the steps that you took and how you stayed focused is, is very helpful. And I think it's very important uh, to understand that, you know, it is a serious exam and, and preparation does need to be taken seriously for sure. Um, Ona, I'd love to uh, transition over to you and dive more into your CFP exam prep. Um, so similar question that I had asked Mike, you had industry knowledge starting the certification process. You know, did that help as you prepare and did taking the capstone course you know, help as you prepare as well or did you find that you needed to supplement other areas more in, in your review? Yes, uh, thank you. I, I would e echo everything that Mike said and um, and also that you had said. Um, my path was a little different just because I had taken uh, the exam a couple times. Um, I do think that the capstone class or the capstone project was a good introduction for me, I would call it that, um, to studying because um, it, it definitely pulls from the different areas. Um, I feel I, like, as Mike said, I think that ex your experience helped, my experience helped. But it also taking the exam, it's you're taking an exam. It's not helping a client and it's it's very tailored. You have to take the exam with the board, how the board is asking the question. <laughs> and, I, and I agree exactly what you were saying, Mike. Um, I I think that take, especially on the accelerated path, taking a um, review class is imperative. Um, really because it's the it's the different areas um and and i i think the the most important thing number one is taking the exam at the best time for you i took an exam in july i took it in november and i took two in march um i i think um i had started the last time i i took the exam started studying in november because i thought as a cpa this is it's quieter um most cpas i would not recommend taking it in march um i took it in march because i worked for a different firm i was not doing tax returns um but take it when it's the best time for you um by the time i took it for my fourth time I was, I had picked myself off the floor and like, damn, I can do this because I'm already a PFS. I'm a CPA. Like I can, I, this exam is not a beast. Like I am the beast. So it's changing my mindset and I was all in. And so Danko, I did everything he said, as Mike, as Mike uh, said, I did everything he said. I made a study schedule. I, I, they said exactly how much to study. Um, I got up early, 5 a.m. I was studying. Um, and every week I increased my study time. Um, I was focused. And again, as I said earlier, my challenge was focus. And, and I was like, damn, I'm not going to let it get to me. I did an extra tutoring um, with Mike Long and Adam Shear. They did like an extra class I did, which really helped me. Uh, and then I did one-on-ones. Um, Amy Lease was something that uh, Brent Danko offered, which really helped me psychologically. Taking Failing three times and being in for the fourth time, um, it was really hard. And so I had to, uh, she helped me focus my studying. Um, right before I took the test, I had an unbelievable amount of anxiety. Uh, she helped me there. So um, I think bottom line, do what's right for you. What was right for me may not be right for you. Take the exam when it's right for you. You know, whether taking the test virtual or in person is right for you, really be honest with yourself. And, and I would, that's a big thing, like be honest with yourself, refocus every day, be all in. Um, and I think the last thing I would add is ask for um, employer support. I think all those things were really crucial for me um, and having that support, being able to say, to take off some time for studying, um, especially as it got closer, really helped me tremendously. I took off a week before the exam. Um, like I said, like I was all in, like I, if I didn't pass that exam, like I could say I did everything in my power to pass that exam. And, and I did. So um, do what's right for you, bottom line. 
That's oh, and great. one thing, and I'm sorry, I wanted to add one last thing. I think the CFP board does a great job as far as posting things to their website. There's toolkits, um, and I'm looking right now at five habits of successful candidates. Um, you know, develop a study strategy, dedicate time to studying each week, ask for support, use exam prep tools, and balance, balance studying with self care. Um, the board, I feel like, um, and and Brett Danko uh, touch touches on this. Like, if the board touches on it um, on some of, on their um, their toolkits and as far as the practice standards, like you should know it. So really learn learn the CFP board website. Like, navigate around and and know the different um, tools and resources that are available. That's great. Thank you. And that's that's great advice. Yes, we we do have a lot of really helpful information or places to point you in the right direction of, you know, things to look out for. Um, but yeah, just your experience, I think, is, is very helpful to share. And, you know, uh, your experience, you know, what, what you did to prepare and, you know, refocus was, was great. Do you remember um, how much time you dedicated to preparing for the exam each day or on a weekly basis, you know, about how many hours you were studying? Um, I would say at the beginning, I think it was, I'm trying to call up my spreadsheet, you know, as a, as an, a CPA, um, I, I think 10 to 15 hours um, a week. And then I think as it, oh, here, I've, I've got it. Um, as I got closer, I definitely increased it. My top you know, total time, I know for everybody's different, you know, and, and Mike, um, you know, took it once and, and he was able to do it, um, you know, with kids and being a mom and like all those things, like it was just, it was tremendously um, challenging for me, but um, I 10 to 15 hours, then I ramped it up, I would say 20, 30, and then right towards the end, my last week I did 73, um, but then I was doing, let's say 40, you know, 40, you know, so again, it just just really trying to ramp it up, add more hours, and really on the weekends I did a whole lot more. You know, if I could do, you know, two, if I got my good time in, and and I think one of the the tips that Brett gives is, you know, when is your best time to study? And mine, I'm focused in the morning. So I got up, kids were asleep. I could get in two hours. Maybe I did an hour at lunch, um, maybe an hour, you know, later if I could, um, and then more on the weekend. Um, so just finding your best times. Wow. That's, I mean, that's definitely dedication. And I think, you know, it sounds like you have a spreadsheet and you had a whole plan put together that you could follow and, you know, really, really look at each day to, to say, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Well, and I think the other thing that really helped me was, you know, I made that spreadsheet and, um, and I tracked myself, you know, I would, I, I said, okay, well, I'm going to do 10 hours this week. And then when I, that day I'd go back in and I'd say, okay, well, I studied two today or today I did one hour and then I'd have my totals. So as you get further down in your studying, you're so a lot of times you're like, oh my gosh, I still don't know this. How do I not know this? And, and mentally, again, it's such a challenge. You're, you're running a marathon. It's not a sprint. And to be able to look at back at that spreadsheet and say, you know what? I've already put in a hundred hours. Like I've got this, like I've got this. And just reminding yourself, like I can do this. And I, and that's just part of the challenge of this exam is just, it's, it's what, you know, but it's also, it's mental. And so, you know, just, just again, reminding yourself, you know, you're putting in the time you're doing the work um, and you're getting there. So that's important. Yeah, that's great. And, and last question for you here, what advice would you provide to someone who is going through the accelerated path to prepare? Is there anything, anything else that you would say, you know, okay, you've bypassed the coursework, you know, this is, this is something that I think that you should, should do, or make sure you do as part of that kind of accelerated path to taking the exam? I mean, besides taking the review class, I would recommend, yeah, you know, focusing on your weak areas. It's not necessarily doing more questions. It's sometimes focusing in on the studying. Um, and, and so you, like, you know, the core stuff, if I kept doing more questions, but I don't understand the why it doesn't, it doesn't help me. So again, just refocusing every day. I really, you know, you kind of have a, a way you're going to study in your mind, but then you get to it and it's, it's like, oh, you know, I need to focus on this. So refocusing um, and, and really, if you need help, just reach out. There's always somebody, you know, who can help and, and maybe getting a tutor if you need some help. Like for me, I could not get in my head um, I put some calls to me were just beyond difficult. Um, and so just reaching out, like, can you help me? Can you talk through this? Can, you know, and, and, you know, people are willing to help and point you in the right direction. 
That's great. Thank you. Um, and, you know, I think just I want to thank you both so much for sharing your experience. Are there any other thoughts that you have before we wrap up? I do have um, a question here. You know, did you did you find that the capstone course was sufficient enough for, you know, to cover cover going into the review course before taking the exam? You know, do you wish you had taken a couple supplemental courses, you know, I, I guess kind of looking back at what you know now? Um, and, and anything else? Um, Ona, I'll ask you first here. Uh, for me personally, I would say no. I, I, you know, the capstone was a good introduction, I would say for me. Um, taking the review class, I feel was suffi sufficient. Doing what they tell you to do in that, I feel like was sufficient. And then I would supplement what I had there. I say, I because for me, not taking the coursework ahead of time was a blessing and a curse because I didn't have to take it. It was a blessing because I didn't have to take it. It was a curse because I didn't have to take it. And so, you know, it, it's, it's again, just being honest with yourself. I, I, if I had to do it again, I don't know that I would go back and, and do stuff ahead of the capstone. I would just do the capstone, do the review, do exactly what they tell you to do, reach out if you need extra help and, um, and take the exam. That, that, that's what I would do. Great. Thank you. Mike, uh, I'd love to know your perspective. Sure. Um, I realized I had a couple of things, so I'll try to rapid fire them. So uh, just in terms of the capstone as being sort of a useful part of the review, uh, it had for me at least almost no relationship to like the exam. Uh, you know, they're almost very, they're, you know, writing a financial plan and then studying for the CFP exam for me or the way my brain organizes data at least. They're, they're, they're almost entirely unrelated, uh, uh, you know, in terms of getting ready. So um, you definitely need the exam class uh, for that. And the capstone is just a practical thing. So and useful for that skill set. Uh, just a couple of other random thoughts that, can, you know, I just want to echo what Ona said about, you know, sort of doing things that work for you, doing the things in the rhythm that works for you. Um, I'm a huge fan of remote testing. Uh, I took mine, you know, it was the fall of 2020. Uh, and so remote testing meant I didn't have to worry about test centers closing. It meant I didn't have to get up earlier. I didn't, I didn't have to worry about parking or traffic or anything. I did have to chase my family out of that, out of the house. So, um, you know, you, not everybody can do it, but uh, remote testing was really, really great. Um, and I just also, you know, flashcards were great. Big fan, um, you know, practice questions. I think we all know when we study for exams, practice questions are great. And then just a note that Wrong answers in practice are more valuable than right answers. Like getting the question wrong is more useful because then you you have to figure out why, and that's how you learn it. Uh, and then I guess really lastly is um, since I got the CFP, I then I proceeded to get I think two or three additional designations since then, um, and I'm working on another one now. Uh, and so it became a really useful springboard to having a broad based understanding of a bunch of things that you can then go and additionally specialize in in various ways. Um, so I found that really helpful. Uh, oh, and somebody asked in the chat about man managing uh, continuing education requirements. And uh, the additional designations I get satisfy, end up satisfying my CFP continuing ed requirements, except for I think the ethics one. So that's the only one I actually have to do separately because I'm always doing other things. That's great. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, well, I just thank you so much. And um, We'll transition now back to John. Thanks, Amanda. Actually, a couple of things I want to add to what I shared in the beginning about the requirements. Just a reminder, if you have a designation that we've talked about today that qualifies, you want to send that to education at cfpboard.org. Um, there, were, there were a couple um, questions about the experience requirement. And I would be remiss in reminding everybody on the line today that these, we're, we're talking about the education requirement. The, this doesn't get you out of the other requirements. Um, and there were a few questions um, of people following up on the experience requirement. We, we still require three years of relevant personal financial planning experience. So if you have a lot of experience in corporate finance, unfortunately, that's not going to count. Um, and for more information on our experience requirement, um, you want to go to cfp.net slash experience, um, and there's a 
a very clear description of what we're looking for. If you want to get your experience uh, preliminary, preliminarily reviewed, in other words, you want to find out if your experience even counts before you pursue certification, you would need to create an account with us at cfpboard.net. You would then want to go to our experience tool, and that link is also in that section that I said, cfpboard, I'm sorry, cfp.net slash experience. And if your experience counts, our experience team will review it. Um, and we will provisionally accept it, meaning that it's accepted pending successful completion of the exam. There's also a second part of our education requirement. So the first part is the coursework requirement, which is what we've been talking about for the past 45 minutes. The other education requirement is an undergraduate degree. Um, so these designations, experience, there are no substitutions for the undergraduate degree. So our education requirement is two pieces. You must have an undergraduate degree and you must meet the coursework requirement. And our discussion today has been about the coursework requirement. Um, and so hopefully that has um, answered. I've seen several questions uh, about what I uh, talked about today. Um, just a reminder, once you submit it, uh, oh, there are also confusions about the capstone course. The capstone course is a, just like any other three credit college course, as we said, it, and, and I think there's been several links today on how to find a, a capstone course, whether it's online or near you. Um, it is not a review course, and it is, as we've heard from our panelists today, it is not a substitution for the, the preparation that you need to put in in order to be successful on the exam. And I think that's it. Um, anything else I missed, Amanda, or anything else we should cover? No, I think I think the, that's the questions. And, and if, you know, if there are any other questions, we yep. can definitely follow yeah, up. And, he, and here are the links for, for additional questions. Get certified 2022 at cfpboard.org. The questions you would send there would really be general certification uh, question requirements. If you have a specific capstone, not capstone, if you have specific accelerated pathway questions, you can send those to education at cfpboard.org. And then of course, additional resources uh, are here at cfp.net slash accelerated path. Um, and as I've also mentioned, cfp.net slash experience. And I want to thank everybody who joined us today and have a great day.